All right. We're starting pretty late, actually. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh my gosh. Good job, us everybody. start. Um, okay, how many of you guys were here for last week's? And I just want to, okay, all right, so pretty much everybody. Or, so um, I mentioned this before, but pretty much everything that I am, am discussing going forward kind of compounds on what was shown in previous presentations. And so as a consequence, you know, you might be at a little bit of a loss if you haven't seen the previous presentations. So we do have those up online. So unfortunately, I just don't, yeah, it is clever. That is clever, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's who is that handsome fellow? Uh, but um, at any rate, uh, I have a sort of a gallows sense of humor. I'd be laughing on the way to my own execution. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah. So uh, last week, I I wanted to hit on one final point. We were talking about bait din, you know, before I start this presentation and. Um, Bef before you walk away with this idea that bait din are like this unlimited uh, or li this limitless uh, solution for everything, um, it it's important to realize that we live in a secular modern society. You know, we live in the Western world, and as a consequence, um, if you have a religious court, whether it was like a Torah court or a Sharia court in the West or any kind of court, any kind of religious court that you can imagine. Um, there are some things that they can control as far as arbitration and things of that nature. And oftentimes, for example, in, in a Beit Din, in let's say New York, uh, local county courts will defer to arbitrations that are given by a Beit Din. However, we're not living in the Roman Collegium either. So there is a little shortfall when it comes to enforceability. You know, um, a Beit Din today can't order you lashed, obviously, or, or imprisoned or... or find or anything of that nature and really enforce that. I think Peter was talking about last week how um, uh, different churches today, for example, are like different puddles and you could hop to from one to the next. So you could maybe, if you were in, a, let's say, a Protestant church, and as I said, there's sort of a galaxy of different denominations, um, you could, if you're at odds with the leadership there or you were facing discipline, you could just quit and drive down the straight, d drive down the road 20 minutes the other direction and melt into a new crowd and no one ever, ever be the wiser. And so there's a limitation on enforceability when it comes to these things. Um, but anyway, uh, I wanted to say that. So, um, and as before, none of this is about your particular marriage, your particular divorce, your particular uh, remarriage. Um, this is, again, as I said, just, just gallows humor. And um, this is, as I said also before in previous presentations to anybody who's new to this, this isn't devotional. I'm not going to explain to anybody uh, love and commitment and the feelies and shalom in the home. There's been presentations on that and teaching hours on that ad nauseum. And uh, so if you're looking for that, you know, um, we'll just keep jousting past one another. And I don't know <laughs> if we'll have a solution there. But um, anyway, I thought I would start you off. Uh, well, one final disclaimer. I'm going to be playing devil's advocate today. Um, and this is because for most of your lives, religious leaders have told you about divorce and told you to avoid divorce, which I think is good. I mean, it's good. It's a good lesson to teach people to avoid divorce at all costs. This is divorce. It's over here. It's really scary and you should avoid it and blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's terrible. And oh, by the way, did I mention you shouldn't divorce and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to play the devil's advocate today, and I'm going to, I'm not going to, it might come off as though I'm selling it, and I'm not, believe me, I think it's terrible. God hates it, and I hate it too. But at the same time, this has to be kind of a counterbalance. I think that there are probably some situations that the Bible says there is a, a necessary amputation or cautery or whatever medical uh, terminology you want to use to describe it, it, it's very wrenching, but sometimes the Bible suggests that it's necessary. And so I'm going to try and, uh, I guess, explain the merits of divorce. It, it puts me in kind of a bad situation, like I have to explain the merits of capital punishment or something. So 
And that's anybody who knows what that little uh, phrase at the bottom, lasciate ogni speranza, voi ci entrate. Anybody knows what that, that is? Yes, abandon all hope, ye who enter here, above the gates of hell. You know, so welcome. You know. <laughs> Here's a fruit basket. Welcome to the neighborhood, your own little suburb of hell. Um, so I wanted to open with a meditation. Um, and I think that there are certain religious psyches that can fall prey to kind of a, it's an unhealthy martyrial pathology, which is as long as I'm suffering, I know that I'm on the right path. I've met people like that, you know, the, the, the only way that they can make sense of a God or, or, or a heaven or a universe like that is as long as I'm suffering, I'm on the right path. And so, I mean, we often, you know, in the Middle Ages, we, we see the flagellants. They go through the plague-ridden towns and they whip themselves because, well, suffering must be the only way to get to God, really. It can't, there can't be any other way. It can't be devotion or prayer or anything like that. It's suffering, you know, and so... Um, so all of you have heard about Hillel quickie divorces uh, at this point, I'm sure, in Messianic Judaism. It's kind of like par for the course. So I'm going to start you at the opposite end of Hillel, which is no divorce ever. Um, pastor and theologian John Piper of Bethlehem College and Seminary, he's retired now. He maintains that there can be no divorce absolutely ever. So he's the exact opposite of Hillel or I guess those quickie divorce, like 1-800-DIVORCE that you see along the roadsides. He's, he's the exact opposite on the spectrum. There can never, ever be a divorce in his, in his uh, gospel. Basically, it's until death. So if there's abuse, you can separate, but you can't divorce. Or, you know, you should probably try to reconcile um, if you can. But if you can't reconcile, then you're basically supposed to be celibate for the rest of your life. And that's that's uh, how John Piper would view it. And there's some uh, Protestant denominations that view it that way. And so... Um, so he's drawing, I think, there's, there's two verses I think that he would uh, draw from. And I, again, I don't agree with this, but I'm just trying to give all sides, all perspectives. We talked about Hillel, and we're talking about the, the other side of the coin. But Romans 18, you know, in Ephesians chapter 5, or Romans 8, 17, and Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 37. So oftentimes there are these, in the New Testament, these parallels between the cosmic wedding and our own little terrestrial wedding here. And because of that, he's basically saying that, well, because that one can't come to an end, this one can't either. And he characterizes the suffering that a person might feel in that relationship. Well, that you're just, you're just experiencing Christ's suffering, and you're suffering with Christ, and that's how he would see it. Um, and um, so, um, in light, I, I just put a smattering of verses here. Um, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. I've been... My yoke is easy, my burden is light. But then the opposite. If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Then the master and Mark. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Mark 10. So, does the master view things like Mr. Piper? Thoughts? He does not, Hmm. because... Piper's drawing a, a firmer line than Moses did. Yeah. I mean, God gave us that because of the hardness of your heart. Yeah. Because humans are imperfect, because they don't get it right, you permitted it. If it's permitted, it's permitted. It can't be permitted and not permitted. at the same time. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, a, I don't know, the office space, the pieces of flair. I don't know if you, uh-huh. the metaphor, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Well, yeah. It's it's an exercise in unclear directions. Like anyway, um, anybody else have thoughts on that? So, Ramon, go ahead. I can't say for sure, but I know that the apostles got a little scared when he heard him talk about divorce. Yeah, they did. They yeah. were like, "Well, if this is how it's going to be like, yeah. it's better, better not to get married. Better to be yeah. celibate." So I would say that he is ninety percent probably. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. because he said from the beginning it was not so, and because of the hardening of your hearts, yeah. so now you have to now you have to see what's the reason, yeah. and if the reason is that you are so sensitive and so difficult, and you so don't want to love your enemy, yeah. then maybe maybe divorce is not for you. There's cases I do believe there is abuse where the yeah. like like Shaul said, if he leaves. 
and there's nothing you can do. He just he, he left. Up and he, yes, he abandoned. An unbelieving, an unbelieving abandoner. But now he never he never says an, a believing abandoner. Strangely enough, I guess his idea is that it's the one that abandons. Yeah, yes. and he, I think that's the way that uh, the the uh, church interpreted. I think that's actually correct. Um, We'll shun them. We'll shun them, and they basically are out now. Yeah. Or, or they will do, do the right thing, basically, and reconcile to begin with. And if, and if they... Small community, yeah. you know, that would be the case. And if they don't su submit, I guess, to the discipline, then they would be, then become an unbeliever, and therefore, you know, and so it's kind of... Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So I'm going to give some background on divorce. Now... I asked those questions. I'll get you in a second. I asked those questions because um, these are just kind of, I guess, an opening salvo, opening thoughts. Um, in, in some presentations from now, if I get to that, uh, I'll get to an interpretation that David Instone Brewer, he's a, the foremost Christian Talmudist. <laughs> I didn't know there was such a thing. Um, and he's, uh, yeah, he, he, goes through, he goes through the Gospels and actually makes the case about what the, the master as well as Paul believed, and does, and some and some uh, passages, for example, uh, it'll say like in Matthew, in case of uh, sexual indecency, you know, and then in like you know in the previous in the previous verse, Mark, it doesn't even say that. It just says if you divorce and remarry, you're committing adultery. Where these the other one will will say that. So why are these two verses discrepant? And then. If you took a hard line on that, those, those particular passages and said, just said uh, adultery, then Paul is saying also abandonment, which is material neglect and other things. And so it's like, wait, is, some people have said, well, that's just Pauline prerogative. What he, as a disciple, binds here on earth, you know, is bound in heaven. But um, I think Brewer's approach is to take a more of a harmonized approach between Yeshua and – go ahead. I want to challenge the question. Yeah. And here's how I want to challenge it. Uh -huh. uh, <coughs> I think it's the, the question should actually be the reverse. Mm -hmm. Is is Mr. Piper's view like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well. No. No. But, uh, let me let me be yeah. clear, right? Yeah. Because the the danger here mm -hmm. is that it's like comparing a uh, mm -hmm. a kit car or a, like I mean like a toy yeah. car mm -hmm. to yeah. a Fer a real Ferrari. Yeah. It's like is is the Ferrari the like car. the? No. No. Yeah. We have the archetype, the real. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then the question is, is the reductionist copy uh -huh. in any way like <coughs> the, 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 the origin of the paradigm, sure. right? Yeah. And so, so it, it, the danger here uh, is, mm -hmm. is to create Piperism, right? Kind of oh, like sure. Calvinism or whatever <laughs> ism yeah, you want to yeah. create. Yeah. Like all of that stuff is reductionist. Well, I, I agree that he's not on par with the Messiah. I totally yeah, agree. Yeah. It's just the way I worded yeah. it, you know. But yeah, yeah. We're, yeah, I'm not. Um, but anyway, so I'll talk about the Levantine context of divorce, um, just like the prenup involved in dowry in Ketubot, the institution of divorce was designed to protect the rights of all parties, prevent abuse, divvy the estate, and provide clarity and stability moving forward. And societies in Canaan and Mesopotamia achieved this with varying results. And since women had to be sort of accounted for, uh, I, people have often compared them to chattel, and I don't think that in Torah the women were chattel, but um, they had to be accounted for in ancient societies. Um, they needed to be. They needed to be certain that they could remarry and move forward, you know, either as a as a widow in bereavement or divorcee. And so, some city states allowed f women in Mesopotamia, I believe, to divorce, while others did not. Others only allowed them if the man were at some, uh, you know, fault of some sort. So, um, it, it varied from city state to city city state in Mesopotamia. And this is Hammurabi's code, eye for an eye. Um, he was a Babylonian king who lived a little bit, well, a lot before Moses, and so um, he kind of struck a middle ground between all the city-states, and he allowed women to divorce if the husband were at fault. If a woman so hated her husband that she has declared, you may not have me, her record shall be investigated at her city council, and if she was careful and not at fault, even though her husband has been going out and disparaging her greatly, that woman, without incurring any blame at all, may take her dowry and go off to her father's house. If she was not careful but was a gad about, thus neglecting her house and humiliating her husband, then they shall throw that woman into the water because that's what you do. <laughs> throw her into the water. They have these over-the-top punishments. Um, now, 
here's an example, particularly harsh, um, from Middle Assyrian law. And it basically says, you know, if a woman, and this, I'm, I'm not going to read all this, but it basically says that um, if there is a husband and he abandons his wife, goes off, immigrates, sojourns into some other country, what have you, um, then she has to hold a candle for him for five years. Five years. So think about that. You're a woman and you rely off this man for material provision. And this harsh Assyrian law demands that you hold a candle for five years. And so if on, I guess, the fourth year you were to assume, oh, he's not going to come back, and you marry somebody else and rebuild your house and have, you know, you have a kid on the way and everything, and then, like, on the week before your husband comes back, he gets to take you back and take your, you know, kid and sell him into slavery or whatever. Um, and so it's pretty harsh in uh, demanding that a person just, be chained to this person indefinitely and not be able to move on with their lives and not really have a livelihood. And so um, that's middle Assyrian law. And so then there's something similar also in Mesopotamia called the widow's tablet. When a woman has been given in marriage and the enemy has captured her husband, she shall complete two years and then she may go to live with the husband of her choice. They shall write a tablet for her as a widow. This tablet assumes that the death of the captured assumes the death of the captured husband, not simply long departure. It has similar language, and is the precursor for the Jewish get, declaring she may go wherever she pleases. Um, to the gets, she may marry whomever she pleases. Very similar language, uh, even in the New Testament. Paul uses that. You know, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes. But he must not belong to. But but he must belong to the Lord. Corinthians, and so Paul is actually using get language there to describe uh, inner marriage uh, among believers, um, and uh, so anyway. And so there's a brief little um, uh, excursus here, I think, but it's a uh, rape and repercussions for the victim um, when the, the Torah te seems to. Um, treat fornication and rape similarly. So if a maiden is sort of, I guess, either just maybe she's not raped, but she's taken advantage of, or they, they fornicate, so to speak, and both willingly and consentingly, uh, the Torah kind of treats that in a similar way because that puts the woman in a place of hardship or shame. When a virgin is raped, the general ancient Near Eastern law was for her rapist to suffer the death penalty and for her to go unpunished. And so this is from the laws of Ashuna. If a man gives bride money for another man's daughter, but another man seizes her forcibly without asking the permission of her father and her mother and deprives her of her virginity, this is a capital offense and he shall die. The woman who's the victim is not punished, but there's a problem because her future is basically ruined. In an honor society, she is pretty much damaged goods at this point, and she has to just kind of cover her head and go into reclusion, and she can't – she's sort of in this limbo space. She's not, she's not a virgin. She's not a matriarch. She's not a, a mother. She's not a wife. She's not any of those things. She's kind of fallen out of time and space, if you will. And that's kind of the worst thing, actually, that could happen to a woman in that time and place. Um, so, for example, um, you know, in, in other codes, as I mentioned, a rapist or an illicit lover was killed, and the once virgin was left stranded and unwanted. In the Torah, she would be given the right of first refusal over the man. It's unlikely that she would be forced to marry her rapist, as is often suggested. The obligation, rather, fell to, onto her lover or her rapist. Um, she was forced to pay the mohar. He was forced to pay the mohar and spare her from a fruitless search, a humiliatingly small dowry, or a lifelong celibacy. He could never divorce her, and she had few, if any, obligations to him. In fact, when Amnon uh, rapes his sister Tamar and tries to send her away, she responds, Oh no, my brother, she said, sending me away would be worse than the wrong you've already done, which is pretty insane. I mean, an incestuous rape, not as bad as being a woman left in limbo uh, at that time. And so, uh, so the get kind of comes in the context of this and tries to smooth some of this out. The Jewish get represents a landmark moment in the history of human relations, law, gender equality, and human rights. And for this reason, the Torah stands out among all the draconian laws of the ancient Near East as the most progressive in history theretofore, with a code of compassion, accountability, and redemption. And like human slavery, the Torah finds an imperfect situation and sets it on a higher trajectory. 
So the Jewish law, or the Jewish get is not like the uh, Assyrian law demanding that a woman has to wait for five years before she can reconstitute her life. Uh, it, it basically says to any man that's going to ditch his wife saying, you know, you can't do this to a woman. You have to give her some clarity and certainty and closure so she can rebuild her life. And so there is no precedent. And Stone Brewer points out in his book, uh, Divorce and Remarriage in the Bible, um, he points out that there is no precedent in the ancient Near East of this. This is one of the most progressive things you'll ever see. Um, you know, it, it doesn't treat a woman like she's a, a, a head of cattle. So um, here's the formula of a get, and this is from Mishnah Gittin 9.3. Lo, you are permitted to any man, Rabbi Judah said, and this shall be uh, to you from me a writ of divorce and a bill of release, a get of dismissal, that you may be married to any man you wish. And again, Paul cites this exact same language in Corinthians, talking about marriage, using get language. So he was pretty familiar with this process, evidently. Um, and so, and as previously stated, the Gitin had to be written and issued by the husband. He could be coerced, however, into writing one, or he could write it himself, and if he were illiterate, uh, he could lean on a local scribe or rabbi to help him compose it. Some gets will, be, will come with a proviso that she, the woman, may only remarry a Jew. Paul, speaking to Gentiles, widens it by, you know, anybody on Team Avraham, you know, it, they have to be a believer. It's not, just, it's not just Jews, it's also Gentiles who might believe in the God of Abraham as well. Um, Paul widens it, so. Um, but it's basically a proviso for endogamy. Any questions so far? I've gone over a lot, so. Thoughts, ideas? I never knew that the Assyrians could have a more stringent look on marriage and here comes Torah yeah. <laughs> that, that's more lenient. Yeah. I mean, how far have we fallen that, you know, pagans were more strict <laughs> versus... Well, I mean, I, they, I don't know if that's, that's falling in the sense that you're leaving this woman for five years in a state of abandonment, a material abandonment, which is very dangerous at that time. And so that's, that's irresponsible, uh, and, and, and that's, that's what the get argues. And so it's, it's the first, and so basically, and I, I've argued this, it's a historic first, it was restorative, it was redemptive, and it, redemptive, and it was life-saving. It was kinder than Assyrian law to victims, and it paved the way for three eons of advances in human liberty. And so, um, you know, I've grown up and I've listened to, I've listened to preachers everywhere talk about the, the, the lusty, evil Pharisees and their divorce mechanisms and things like that. And not only does divorce get knocked, but so does Jewish divorce especially get knocked from the pulpit a lot. But in the context of when it was first devised, the get is probably one of the most progressive, forward-thinking things, along with a lot of the limitations on slavery that the Torah has that protects victims, that protects women from abuse, um, and, and things of that nature. And so um, it's not... If somebody were to if somebody were to either commit adultery or abandon somebody at at that time period when when we live hand in a hand to mouth existence and we're subsisting off the land and there can be drought and invading armies, uh, things like divorce and things like adultery and things of that nature can be very socially destabilizing and cause a lot of ruin. And so this is this is something that I think ha it has that in mind. And so. I just, I'm saying, and I, I guess I'm reiterating the point, y you're looking sort of retrospectively from then to now, but, you know, John Piper is basically saying that if um, a woman is abandoned, she has to remain celibate for life, not five years, you know, like the Assyrian law says. And there's no get either, obviously. So you, in effect, you know, everybody talks about the gospel being graceful, but you have... You know, Piper's Jesus, Piper's gospel is harsher on women than Assyrian law. It's like you've, and so it, it tells me in a sense that, you know, whatever you think about divorce, the get put humans on a, on a trajectory of advancement for law and rights, and then it just gets totally set back <laughs> in the other direction if we hew to that philosophy, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Go ahead. And so I've got a couple, couple, couple hands raised, so I'll just go through all of you. Go ahead. Yeah. So just a couple, couple of things. So first of all, a lot of, a lot of theology, you know, Piper's theology obviously comes from, primarily from the New Testament. He sees that as a preeminent document. So there's not a lot of, a lot of foundation building on what the Torah says. Like, that's like, that's old stuff. We don't need that. That's why we have something better. Yeah. We have 2.0. So please understand that his theology is predictable. 
it's going to flow a certain way. Because if you limit your pool of what you're looking at and the options that you're considering, and that's that's how it's going to be. And beyond that, there's no tradition also. Yeah. And none of that history that we're talking about and discussing, that that's not a good consideration. So that it's easy to kind of sometimes to mischaracterize his position, but that's where he is. So it it got to kind of sort of be fair. This, yeah. is, this is the game he's playing, and these is, this is the rule book by which he's playing. Yeah. And he comes out with this with this idea. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm not, not, not trying to denigrate him. I'm mean, sure he's a nice guy and everything, but at the same time, um, I mean, he puts this out there as a public individual, and so he's can be criticized publicly. Absolutely. Well, so. Anyway, go ahead. Just an observation, and I guess a follow-up to, to your point. Um, so it's, it's interesting when you see a family. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about law, what does law typically apply to? Families. Some form of governance, yeah. right? So the family, mm -hmm. if you look at the family, it's the smallest form of human governance. It is. Right? And so a, a family is a government, right? Yeah. And if, if you don't know that, you haven't been in a family. Yeah. Yeah. And to not make a decision there is to make a decision. So if yeah. you're claiming you want anarchy in your family, yeah. you want to live in a hippie commune, well, you've made a governmental decision. Right? <laughs> uh, yes. So, you know, as with any government, I mean, our modern symbol of justice is a woman, the sword in one hand, a blindfold, yeah. and what? Yeah, a balance. Yeah. And so oftentimes throughout human history, whether it's the family government mm. or the government government yeah. or the community government or anything in between, we see imbalance. Yeah. We see imbalances and reactions. We see yeah. human civilizations will err on the side of liberality, mm -hmm. and there will be human civilizations that err on the side of, uh, yeah. of extreme, the Assyrian, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so yeah. the justice, in I believe God's message for us, and I think you're uh, stating it eloquently, is balance. Yeah. Right? He wants us to have balance in our lives. And what does that look like? Yeah, I'm not throwing this at you because I, I, everybody's talked about the quickie hillel divorce. I'm just trying to give you the other end so you guys have sort of a sense of spectrum. But uh, Shane, go ahead. I just think it's important to state that as we look from our time period backwards, uh -huh. I don't think anybody here has not lived in a time period where we've had birth control. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. a lot of these laws uh -huh. are necessary and applicative because mm -hmm. when there's intimacy, unless there's infertility or Saying the word correctly? Yeah. Too many languages. Right. Yeah. You're, not able to, you're not fertile. There's going to be babies. There's going to be children. There's going to be responsibilities. And so that makes a huge difference in the way we look at things today because yeah. we have these these things exist. And so people can't grasp a lot of times why these laws were so applicable and necessary. Sure. The laws to get take that into consideration, too. Yeah. If, if you give somebody a get in Judaism, give a woman a get, the man can remarry that same day. Yeah. The woman has to wait. By and large, it's pretty equal as far as you know, being able to uh, move on with one's life as opposed to uh, Middle Assyrian law. So, but there is a little. There's one more question. Laura has a question. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Laura. Who's John Piper? Oh, he's a he's a he's a Baptist theologian. Yeah. Uh, Calvinist Baptist theologian. He's a, so he's, he's Christian extremist. He's, he's not a, he's not an extremist. I mean, he's a pretty famous evangelical uh, theologian. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a very famous. Uh, yeah. I just I just picked one in particular. Who, and there are, there are some others I know who take this attack. My video I don't think is going to play. So anyway, but this is where kind of where theology meets the road. The rubber meets the road. Uh, the issue of abuse also has particular resonance at Bethlehem Baptist. In the years after Piper stepped down in 2013, Bethlehem had its own reckoning on domestic abuse and complementarian marriages. The church went on to revise its stance. And this is good news in, to their, to their uh, credit, to revise its stance on divorce and start a ministry response team to care for victims, Christianity Today. In 2021, three pastors resigned while Bethlehem Baptist was still embroiled in issues concerning spiritual and spousal abuse. And so I guess the question is, you know, Piper is coming at it from a perspective that you have the cosmic marriage and you have to mirror it in your own little marriage in your own lives. And therefore, you could never get divorced because if you get divorced, you're shattering the microcosm of the cosmic marriage. But, you know, is staying in an abusive, continuously abusive sham marriage just to stay together, is that glorifying the Messiah? Is that glorifying, oh, excuse me, is that glorifying the uh, cosmic wedding? That's a, that's a question to ask. As long as I am suffering, I'm on the right path, you see. Go ahead. I, 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 I,
I bring up this point because I remember when I was in uh, my previous religion, a Christian denomination, sure. that there was a lot of like comparing. Uh, you know, divorce is obviously very like, no, this is the worst sin that you can do, trash. right? Um, no, it's, it's, no, it's terrible. Yeah. I'm not saying that it, you know, it shouldn't be looked upon favorably, but like when you, you know, completely damn the people who have gone through it, you yeah. know, it's like you, you put a lot of punishment on victims themselves too, you yeah. know, who, who are struggling. Um, but I think there was also a lot of emphasis on um, Hosea, you know, who God, yes. who was a prophet, who yeah. God was like, oh, go marry this harlot and, mm -hmm. and be steadfast to her as mm -hmm. a representation of my relationship with Israel, right? Yeah. But it's like, what, like that was a something that God told a prophet to do, like it was like a prophet symbol, like when go break some, you know, go make some bread on a pile of dung, right, and yeah. eat it, or go go eat a go eat a scroll. It's like, do we look at all of the prophets and say, okay, this is the mark of like how we should all be acting, or is God sending a different yeah. message here and see like trying yeah. to get a point across? Yeah. So I, I think that that can be difficult when people take Hosea's situation and say, well, you should just like, you know, yeah. you should just be with this person no matter what. You know they have done against you. Yeah. You, you should just stay. Well, I, I don't. I don't think it's a matter of what they've done against you because I do believe that one should repent to turn the other cheek and try to restore. Um, but at the same time, um, it's a matter of like sustainability. For example, I've read a statistic that said that worse than getting a divorce uh, for the kids is actually staying within a toxic home together. That would actually takes a greater toll than a divorce. If, if carried out for the long term. And so it's like, well, in that case, life isn't flourishing anymore, and then, you know, you have a serious problem. So it's not just they did something to me or I'm affronted. I, I don't think that's that, – that to me is not enough. I think that where a lot of the confusion comes in with all of these uh, discussions on divorce and remarriage and the, the example that God puts forward is the fact that um, there's a lot of usage of metaphor in the Bible. Um, God is a husband to Israel, but maybe sometimes Israel is also a son. But then, you know, but there, 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 are some, there are some marriage metaphors, but then at the same time, is our, metaphor, is our marriage like that metaphor in every way? I mean, does my marriage transcend death? No, it doesn't. I mean, the other one does, you know, or, you know, will, will God send me into exile or something, you know, or you know, will my, my husband send me into exile or something of that nature? There are a lot of ways in which, in which people sometimes, I think, get lost in the metaphor and they think that the thing is one-to-one that both things are one-to-one, -one, and they lose themselves in the metaphor and realize that metaphors are imperfect likenesses. And there are some ways in which it's not alike. And, and I can point, you know, I can point to that. Like, uh, God is married to the entire human race. It's like, so, so does that mean God condones polygamy? It's like, well, no. So you can't compare marriage to, you can't com compare human marriage to, you know, the, the divine marriage of God to existence, so to speak. And so, go ahead, Anthony, you can raise your hand. I'm ignoring you. Sorry. I know. I feel so, I'm going to cry. Um, I, I think we're still in this, I know we're in the synagogue here, and we're coming from a biblical standpoint. But I, I just think that there is divorce on Hashem's part, or at least separation sure. on Hashem's part, in many facets. Um, and though we, in some of that, we may have to wait to the end, to the heavenly court, to find that final divorce. If not, then uh, judgment is is useless. Yeah. And if we don't believe in that, then we have to believe in the Gilgal, yeah. that the soul is going to be reincarnated until it fixes itself to get to Hashem, if there's been no separation. Now, there's a... There's a there's a Christian saint named Saint Gregory of Nyssa. You should probably look into him because he was kind of a mystic and kind of. So anyway, but um, uh, somebody, you were raising your hand, Ramona, I think, and I've been in. Well, I really wanted to mention exactly what Danielle already mentioned, Hosea, uh, yeah, because okay. when you're talking about suffering, he's the first one that your mind goes to, mm -hmm. and then you know Jeremiah, whose wife has to die for him to pursue his religious, uh, you know, mission. But I wanted to give you, like, coming from a church or evangelical background, sure. like in rural Romania, for example, mm -hmm. if you had an abusive husband in a Pentecostal church, mm -hmm. the, the teaching was you remain faithful to God, you suffer, you suffer through it, and God will intervene. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he would. I mean, the husband would die. 
So basically, and, and then you have to wait for that. Women, no. This, Please kill my husband. This is very real. This is very real. It's, it's, it's almost like you, if you suffer, if you suffer enough, and you're so faithful, uh, you would often hear in churches praises to say, you know, I've suffered so much, and it was it was God Himself that intervened, and you know, just liberated me without yeah. me having to divorce or so there is this mentality is ingrained mm. in rural places if, where, you, where you really want to save serve God with all your might and you are you're trying to adopt that I'm, I'm, I'm a slave of God and I you know suffering is part of you know it's it's, it's very much but, but let me let me follow that up with why would it be more rural places to do that and I think that those people might be living a much tougher, hard scrabble existence that might require more family solidarity. Yeah, go ahead. Well, what? Like Russians with vodka, we have our own little drinking, and they would oh, yeah. drink and then come home and pick on something, and the wife would get yeah. uh, pretty much beaten up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but to, to kind of defend Piper, maybe we have to look at his extreme view as a fence law. It's better I, I, to I, be I, very, yeah. very strict about divorce so that it's not as easy and just... Yeah. yeah. He, he, to his credit, oh, James, you've been raising your hand tonight. I think. I'm going to go ahead and finish your thought because it may not. Okay. Well, anyway, no, go ahead. Go ahead. But I think what I'm seeing is, um, I, and I haven't spent a lot of time in tractates, Katine, and Katubu, cover to cover. Yeah, yeah, stuff. Um, yeah, and there is a lot of mercy there, you know, even before divorce, there are, if you change your career, I, the first week you mentioned, if you, if you're of a certain career, a sailor comes to mind, right? Yeah. There's a certain responsibility on the male. If you change your career, mm -hmm. the sages realize that you need to change your katubo. You've, you've changed oh, yeah. the, re you know, so it's a lot of it is to protect people. What I find is kind of the problem, the oral tradition is vital here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. To explain all the reasons, like why, why the metaphor can't be used literally, why the remez can't be shot. That's the way the Jewish world has mined this information from the Bible. Mm. The sages have no interest, and we said this thing before, in, in governing Gentile marriage. That's kind of, you can do that on your own. Mm. The problem is when the allowance for non-Jewish weddings is then superimposed back on the Bible yeah. without the Jewish oral tradition. Yeah. And that's why Piper, I mean, yeah. the sages would say that's not what the Torah says, but you are free to make your own yeah. biblical version of what marriage is. We just don't have, we don't see that in the Torah. And it's, that's yeah. what I think is the problem. They're now yeah. being conflated mm -hmm. as if there's one simple model clear from the Bible. And I don't think there's a way to reconcile it in some well, cases. I'll, I'll, uh, I'm just going to give you a teaser for what lies ahead. But um, I, I tend to think that... Um, Views, I, I think that the master probably agreed with the Pharisees on like 98% of, of topics, okay? So what the writers are gonna, of, the, of the New Testament are going to do is they're going to focus in on that 2% to differentiate the hero, so to speak, uh, the, the, the master. Um, and so as a consequence, um, a lot of things, like Jesus never gets up and says, oh, by the way, don't eat pork, and remember, the, rem remember to wear your talus, or lay your tefillin, and remember to keep the Shabbos. He doesn't really do that, you know? Um, Everybody at that point kind of already knew that. So rabbis in general didn't do that. They kind of got up and said, they, like somebody asked them, Rabbi, what if I'm on a desert island and pork is all I have to eat? Or what if, what if I have to save a life in a Shabbos? It deals more with dilemma and the frontiers of, of these types of things. And so I think, a, I think the master didn't mention a lot of these cases because it was just simply consensus at the time. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Bounce off of what I said previously about governance. Uh -huh. So it's, it's interesting because if you look at it on a grand scale, the government itself, you realize how political it is, yeah. right? So, for example, like uh, it's a metaphor here, but but you might say infidelity mm. in a marriage is the equivalent of treason, oh, yeah. and because you're giving yourself to another yeah. nation, yeah. another nation state, right? Yeah. And so. In most t in most periods of history, I uh, will all comment on the our current era. Uh, treason was a capital offense. Well, it was yeah. if you committed treason, right? You were no longer welcome in that nation. In fact, you were no longer welcome in this world. Well, you might have a situation, you know, in the case of a, like adultery, for example, where uh, one one party says to the one one wealthy family says to another wealthy family, 
this, this, this girl you gave us, she's, she's not pure. And then the other family says, what are you saying? Our, our, our daughter is a harlot, you know? And then you have a Hatfields and McCoy situation. And so, <laughs> I, as I said, it's a, it's a destabilizing thing for that kind of modern yeah. society. And so I noticed that. I think, if I recall correctly, when, when it talks about stoning the two adulterers, it, always, it says, let their blood be on their head, which is a, it, it finishes with that statement, which is kind of odd. But when you think about it, it probably prevented a lot of other bloodshed elsewhere and, and strife and turmoil. So these are the grounds for divorce that were considered by the time of the Second Temple period to be, you know, um, grounds for, I mean, proper grounds. So there's neglect of food. Uh, in, or preparing food if you're the woman, neglect of clothing, neglect of tending to clothing, public humiliation. Uh, public, humi public honor and public humiliation were actually extrapolated by the rabbis to be like an extension of clothing because, like, you wear honor, so to speak. You know, it's something you wear. Um, uh, prolonged, willful sexual frigidity or punitive uh, withholding, cruelty and emotional abuse um, in Exodus uh, 2117. Now, I should, I should, before you idealize Judaism over Christianity, um, both religions at this time were, would allow light disciplinary beatings uh, of women uh, on, on behalf of the husband. So, you know, think of that what you will. Harsh conditions make harsh people, but that was, that was a thing back then. So, um, but there were, I think in Irish law, there was the rule, go ahead. You were raising Oh, yeah. Okay, I gotcha. Well, um, I, I, there's actually an Irish law. It's called the rule of thumb. You know what the rule of thumb is? In Ireland, I think, you were allowed to, you were allowed to discipline your wife with a stick so long as it wasn't wider than your uh, thumb. That's what, so, I mean, like, the, the different, different, courts, different courts in different cultures had, like, yeah, they, you, can, you can take it this far. I mean, it's, I, it's, it's terrible either way, but, again, I think harsh conditions make harsh people. So I, I, I agree with you, Laura. It's, uh, it's something to be frowned on. Um, physical and emotional neglect. Um, and so uh, imposing an unattainable or unreasonable vow on one's wife. Men had vow control. Basically, they had control over the, the vows that a wife was under, according to the Torah. Um, impotence and barrenness, because, you know, you want to be able to pass on your family lineage, and sometimes you can't. And renunciation of Judaism. So if somebody just became an apostate or a pagan. And so... Um, so by the time of the master, it was actually for, for adultery or the accusation of adultery or suspicion of adultery, uh, divorce at this time was considered compulsory. You know, um, somehow, somehow the sages got to the point where they were like, well, if you suspect her or if she did it, you must divorce her. Not that you can forgive her, but you must divorce her. And they would, they would take that as a commandment. Um, and so... Um, now, as far as now, as far as uh, I guess um, sexual neglect and emotional neglect and things like that, those are a bit more swimmy, wobbly variables. So the sages were a bit more reluctant to grant a divorce on the basis of that. I mean, for neglect of clothing or neglect of food, or maybe in the case of an adultery, like these are provable things. You know, you can you could say that this person was owed such so many shekels or so many measures of food, and then. Here's the shortfall, and you can there's a metric to it, but love is kind of something that's kind of hard to measure, you know. And so, the rabbis would try to intervene the, the, to to save the marriage, but they were they were a little bit more reluctant to grant that uh, on on that basis. But they would, they would. Um, so, any questions so far? This is the standard. This is the standard by the Second Temple period, completely consensus view. Every sect of Judaism, Hillel, Shammai, um, I believe the Qumran community, uh, out in the caves, everybody pretty much agreed that this was right here. Maybe I'm, maybe it, there's some small variation, but this was uh, valid ground for divorce. All this was valid ground for divorce at the time. Are you suggesting that even though these things are not in New Testament, they're still kind of sense? Because that's what I was talking about. Sometimes when people make theology, they make it with a limited toolbox. Well, if you, if you go by Sola Scriptura, for example, 
I'm not trying to draw on a hot button contemporary issue, but like say for example, a progressive comes up to you and says, well, Jesus never mentioned homosexuality in the Bible, you know? So obviously he's for it, you know? He's all, he's all about it, right? You know, that, that, it's like, well, so wait, wait. And he never, I don't think he actually talked about Greco-Roman orgies either. So he must be, you know, stamp on that. And so it's like, well, wait a second. Did he need to say that to his audience? No. And so, okay, well, maybe there's a way that you can interpret the silence a bit more, you know. Uh, yeah, so anyway, does that, that, that make sense? And so, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say. No, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well, just to be clear, regarding the last line there, I mean, there, there is a spiritual fornication mm-hmm. also, which is uh, an adultery, which, which he didn't, which he didn't, come out and say either, but we are to assume that that, that is true, and it's certainly supported by Old Testament scripture that, you know, in regards to, to your neighbor, yeah. in regards to leaving Judaism, yeah. um, I mean, if you leave the faith, that, that is a that is a greater sin, for sure. Well, yeah, um, like, like Ezra, for example, Ezra, in the case of Ezra, there was a, basically a mass divorce, where all these Babylonian wives were put away, and that saved the nation of Israel from going right back into what got them exiled in the first place. So anyway, Laura, go ahead. So in light of everything that has been discussed, how do you view what the Bible says? Um, uh, uh, lay down your life and you have your cross and power. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can put that in contradistinction to say my yoke is easy, my burden is light. It's funny how that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Um, there was a uh, church out in California, um, and I'm not going to mention it because it's kind of a horrible case, but there was a woman, um, it came out recently last year, an investigative reporter pointed out that there was a, a woman who was being spousally abused. Uh, I mean, she was being knocked around, and her kids were being abused as well. And um, the, uh, the pastor, the head of this, it was a pretty big, prominent church. You would recognize this guy. And he got up, it was back in 2002, but it's all coming out now. Um, and the husband uh, is now serving a 21-year sentence for child abuse and child molestation. Really horrible, you know. Um, and it's like, well, uh, how much should the wife suffer? How much should the kids suffer? And it's like, well, is their suffering Jesus' is suffering? Or, you know, how, how much do we want to complete this metaphor? You know, are we, trying to, are we trying to make flourishing in life or complete a metaphor, you know? And, and as Yeshua himself says, uh, you know, sometimes you have to look at all the metaphors, right? Yeah. Yeshua says, if you cause one of the least of these who believe in me to stumble, it's yeah. better to put a milk. If you know milk what a milk 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 is, milk. Yeah. it's pretty big. I think the Messiah was put him around the neck and throw him in the heart of the yeah. sea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what God thinks about abusing children. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Okay. I agree. I mean, I, yeah. I don't yeah. uh, disagree with this because I have a friend. <laughs> She suffered abuse from her husband, and, uh, and they found out that he was schizophrenic, so they had to basically yeah. separate him into the kids, so they had to get divorced. Mm-hmm. But I'm talking about in cases where they're not this extreme, in cases where, I mean, oh, yeah. to divorce for physical, emotional, I mean, you have to put some type of measures, right? Sure. Some yeah. type of... Why you have, that's why you have so outsiders looking at this situation <laughs> 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 rather than just a couple coming and yeah, pointing finger and says, I'm tired of the emotional divorce. Because <laughs> because I, I, I can't take it anymore. I agree with you. I mean, I, I think I mean, the Torah does say, for example, withholding is a grounds for, you know, it, it describes that as a grounds for divorce. And that was at the time a ground for divorce and uh, emotional neglect and things of that nature. But there is a fine line, I agree with you, that it could just be, well, I'm just not happy. I'm just not happy, which, you know, I mean, welcome to the, <laughs> welcome to planet Earth. I mean, I'm just not happy. It could be, it could be a, a, a very flaky reason, too, that a person, and so, and so as I said before, uh, Laura, uh, the sages on, on, I guess, the more amorous counts, you know, like sexual frigidity or emotional neglect, were a bit more uh, hesitant to grant a divorce. They would try to intervene for longer, um, before they granted one, but they would grant one in those cases. But I, I think it's a sensibility. You're speaking to a sensibility that they themselves um, kind of have. Yeah, that's the thing. It's a case by case, and I think what happens is that, that a big, big distinction we're seeing here, and I think we're already starting to see emerge, is that, and I, I think Brad just hit the nail on the head. Um, 
Piper in a lot of theologians might make one big theological rule and everything tries to satisfy that. Whereas the sages would say, as again, they look, well, what's this case? What's this case? Let's adjudicate this one. Let's adjudicate this one and so forth. And so they were looking at it more juridically and more on the ground with law as opposed to theology, which is kind of in the spheres and vectors, you know. The guidance of the time of Moses, when he, when he told them, he said, judge and help mm-hmm. decide. The yeah, that, that's, that's a commandment. That's a, you know, that's why we have it. And it's, it's funny because we have it in our Siddur. Restore, restore our judges as at first and our counselors as at the beginning. You know, that's not just a poetic flourish. That's the, 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 the reason, one of the reasons why perhaps our institutions are broken is because we don't have that. And, and that's, that's something that is Jewish people pray for. You, you, an interesting observation I heard actually in the study of screenwriting. And, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, you know, forget the full context of that, but, you know, not to discount the fact that there's a hierarchy to law, mm-hmm. right? Yeshua himself said the whole law is summed up and love the Lord your God with all heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? So there is a hierarchy, but on the other hand, uh, you know, there is a sense in which, you know, the law, you have to consider the full context of the law, and, and which I think you're making that point, and it, the illustration was the mafia, right? So what, there could be a great abuse when you take one law or one concept and put it above all others. So what does the mafia do? They say familia. Family, right? <laughs> so everything can be, uh, uh, every law can be broken so long as you don't break that law, right? You can murder, you can steal, you can do anything wrong yes, as long as you don't transgress the family. The family. You don't be afraid of. You right. Don't go against the family. Right. <laughs> and, uh, so don't the go bottom line is, sure. wait, you, don't go fishing. <laughs> balance, you got to balance all the laws, right? Yeah, yeah. In, in service to the hierarchy. Yeah, and so making one into an absolute, I think, uh, over any other, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's, so here's some examples of like harsh vows and cruelty. So husbands, as you know, in the Bible have control in the Torah over uh, vows. If one set a vow on um, his wife that she was not to go to a house of mourning or to a house of feasting, he must divorce her and grant her her ketubah because, you know, her dowry, because he has closed all doors against her. But if he would urge because of some other matter, it is permitted. And here's actually an interesting case of emotional abuse, very like av- actual cruelty. So this describes a situation where a husband orders his wife every day every, to, to fill a jug of water and go to a midden heap, a manure heap, and pour the jug of water on the manure heap so that it splatters her in front of everybody. And he's doing this as an act of willful cruelty to her. So in that case, the, the sages are like, got to give her a get, you know, uh, right now, yesterday. Um, and so um, and this is, of course, right here. Um, when sexual immorality is described by the master, I don't think it is simply referring to adultery. Um, this is a time in the time of the master when the hangman wasn't hanging anymore. People weren't stoning nearly as frequently. I mean, that was taken, that was arrogated by the Romans, that, that, that particular rite of the Sanhedrin to stone. Um, but... Uh, you know, even then the Jewish public kind of lost its appetite for it. And adultery was one of those things that's just very hard to prove with two people as witnesses. It's just, you know, they could, it, it's, it's, it's really a really difficult burden of proof. But, I mean, like this particular one, for example, um, from, from Mishnah Ketubot, uh, that could also be Erevat Devar or sexual immorality, for example. It's not just adultery when the master is probably talking about that. He's probably, there's a whole, there's a whole, uh, uh, smorgasbord of, of uh, things that one could do that are sexually inappropriate that could fall under that category. So um, anyway, uh, I don't know. We're, we're a little bit going over on time. Do we? Yeah. So we wrap it up. Say what? Say what? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Well, uh, any other questions before I, I just kind of uh, close this? Uh, so. Everybody got wild or something? I think Drake is doing a great job, by the way. This is a really yeah. helpful <laughs> <laughs>